Okay, so welcome to everybody listening now and in the future. This is Birth in Pieces, and we've been having a, a really amazing day of uh, listening to stories first, but Birth in Pieces, the documentary, and then listening to all the ways that we, all the information, so much good information about what is the birth trauma from Kathy Kendall Cackett and all your statistics, Kathy, around what are we actually seeing and how can we talk about it and how can we embrace it and what are the ways that we can define birth trauma and then what are ways we can help with it and I'm going to go more even more in that direction and what can we do to help so let me just start my I sent you all a handout um, I really want you all to have all that information um, and it will be up in the online classroom also Okay. Okay, hopefully you can see my one slide, not two. Can you see one slide or two? Is it one? One? Okay, good. All right, so this is, um, it's called I Had a Baby, um, A Threefold Path to Heal Birth Trauma. And uh, just by way of introduction, I'd like to for those of you who don't know me, I would like to talk just a little bit about my perspective and my work. And I'm a, I'm a somatic therapist. I've been studying pre and perinatal trauma for over 20 years. I started uh, working with understanding the baby's experience. This was um, over, over 20 years ago when a woman in my private practice remembered her birth on my table. And some of that comes out of being a biodynamic craniosacral therapist. I also have founded educational departments and have created my own and have training programs. Um, but I, I have specialized in understanding the autonomic nervous system. And I have actually developed now a way of working with birth trauma, um, just understanding the impacts of what happens even before conception and how that can impact uh, the, the mother, how that can impact the, the partner, birth, other birthing, other parent, and then the baby, and also the staff. Just like Kathy talks about, I have found that I think that if we can support the whole, then we can really make some shifts in the way that we can help um, our, birthing, our birthing families. Uh, I, was, I also wanted to show you who are my influences so I am, a, as a somatic therapist, my primary start was through body work. So I'm a massage and craniosacral therapist, and I do a lot of work with understanding energy in the body, mostly some, uh, you know, through the autonomics, also through polarity, just understanding who we are in our bodies. And I have a lot of training in trauma resolution through the Somatic Experiencing Institute. Those are my primary influences. I have many years in pre and perinatal somatic therapies, and those are my influences. And I'm also very blessed and lucky to have been in a direct relationship with this midwife, Lois Trezice. I think she may be still here on our call, but she and I uh, together developed a model of care. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And also, um, I want to uh, just, uh, just to say that it, it's because of my relationship with the midwife, with Lois in particular, that I've been able to develop ways to understand what happens for, for women in, in birth and, and their partners. And babies are something extra, something I learned that have taken me 20 years to get here, which I'm really hoping I can create training programs so people don't have to take so long to learn. But our model of care starts preconception it includes the baby's experience that the, the baby and birth trauma are addressed immediately. This would be my, my hope that we can develop professionals who can, who can set up a shop right next to hospitals. Like some of you, like I've heard talk about um, the Celeste or there's a couple other from this morning, Jenna Glass. Um, we can work with trauma right away. We can work with even mitigating it while, while women are pregnant. Often they do come to me while they are pregnant because they've had a difficult first birth. And you can also address the baby's experience. 
sometimes the the baby's experience of the parents can can play a role in what's happening during the birth or after birth. So I'm trained to do that. I want to talk a little bit about that, but mostly what I really want to introduce to you is a very simple, direct way of addressing what happens at birth that are traumatic. Uh, so birth, birth trauma is prevalent and damaging, and I'm going to show you even, uh, even more statistics or actually it will, it will give you more of a snapshot of what's happening um, in our country, mostly in the United States, um, in terms of what the trauma is, but the, mor the morbidity for women, their partners, and babies. Um, and the skills that we can learn are for trauma prevention and resolution that can be applied to birthing parents as well as the baby and birth professionals. So it's a holistic model. And it is very learnable and it's replicable and doable. Uh, um, at least I think it is. Maybe you'll tell me afterwards, but I think it's pretty straightforward. I call it the three -pull, threefold path. And Lois and I and the students that graduated from our first program, which we completed during COVID, are having great results with it. And I know that there isn't a lot of data at this point about how somatics can help uh, with, a, with understanding the impact of birth trauma yet. I have talked with somatic body workers and researchers like Stephen Porges, who developed the polyvagal theory about the impact of it, it does have great potential. But up until this point, we haven't had any research that I know of that looks at working with the autonomic nervous system and, and how it can be, um, be supported to, be, to heal from birth trauma. Okay, so just to orient you, these are the things I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk about the impact of maternal and infant morbidity, like what is the trauma? look like not so much in the way Kathy did it's going to be different and then I'm going to take you through the threefold path so when we're working on healing births it's not just working with the birthing parent but I'm also including the partner the staff and the baby and we need to listen to everyone and there's a quality of listening and presence that we teach um, that I would really like to talk about, like the quality of the relational field that between you and the people that you're listening to, that, that we have found is quite healing. Um, and when we're working to try and understand what, what it is that, that's walking in the space, like how is it that you're holding space for someone? These are some of the things that I saw Kathy talk about too, but what, what is birth trauma? How do we define it? Um, it's, it's an actual or perceived threat and injury to the birthing parent or the baby. And it could be, should be defined by the mother, like the, it's in the eye of the beholder. This is from Cheryl Beck, who's written so much about birth trauma. It's about loss of dignity, control, or involvement in just decision-making and about maternity care and birth. And it's often associated with medical interventions um, such as C-section, assisted vaginal birth, or, or, or other things such as forceps or vacuum assist, but is overwhelmingly connected to how they are treated by care providers. And, and these are some of the statistics. These are some of the things that Kathy talked about as well, but between 25 and 34%, and actually I think Kathy, you said 46% report that their births were traumatic, which is a new statistic for me. Um, and between uh, one in four women who give birth will express symptoms of PTS. And it depends on who you read. Um, I love this book by Song and Taylor. I have quite a long reference list at the end of my presentation, but uh, depends on who you read, but between six and 9% of women develop true PTS from birth. And many of them have complex early trauma, which was really, show, which really showed up in this study. This is, um, the work of Krista Dancy, if any of you know her, she's tried to translate some of the research into some really usable and doable uh, so figures like this one. Um, but we found that for early complex trauma, what we're talking about is an attachment, like the insecure attachment and uh, complex trauma from childhood really does play into what happens at births and after births. Uh, so th this is something that came out of the looking at the impact of COVID, which I'm going to talk a little bit 
um, more about later. But they, they saw that birth trauma and depression have greatly increased postpartum during COVID. You can see it's, it was originally so PTS was just considered at 4% by this researcher, and now it's as high as 30%. And then rates of depression, you know, it, I thought this 14% was quite low. I, I think it's more like 20% or more, but it, it even went up high. Even, I have another study I'm going to show you um, that has it even higher. Uh, but we're looking at the impact of this insecure attachment. And some of that has been really exacerbated by the isolation, feeling of lack of support. Um, so there are ways that we can begin to incorporate what, what Lois and I call ghosts or echoes, things from our own history that might be playing a role in how we, uh, we perceive our births. And here's another study, um, this one, um, is actually has a lot more sort of a lot more women involved in it like well, 7000 women are looking at how the high rates are, are now are during covid um, pts now over 40% um, anxiety and depression all gone so up uh, <clears throat> um, with in, in peri, 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 peri mental, per, perinatal and postpartum women so uh, we're looking now at really high rates of suffering in this uh, population that we're trying to help. And here are just a few other considerations. When I began collecting data on what's actually happening out here in the field, uh, we're looking at childhood maltreatment. This comes from a very good textbook. If those of you who are educators out there who are really wanting to work with um, educating professionals. Um, this, this book, Motherhood in the Face of Trauma, <clears throat> has really good chapters in it. And, and Cheryl Beck has one. But it's here where we begin to get very much more granulated about what happens. It's not just about the interventions, the instruments used. It's the way the mother feels about how about what happened. And it, it can sometimes awaken these early, early layers, like the being mistreated as a child. But so, so in this consideration, you'd see childhood maltreatment predisposes women to trauma um, during and after childbirth. That is all forms of physical and emotional ill treatment, sexual abuse, neglect, and exploitation that results in the actual or potential harm to the child's health, development, or dignity. So we're tracking an awful lot of things that happen. And one of the things that we've listened to when, when women are trying or coming into your practice, you may want to consider just assume trauma because one in three adults experience some form of maltreatment. And this has come to us a lot through the adverse childhood experiences. We know that they have a per very pervasive in our culture. But in the US, one in three women and one in six men have experienced some form of contact sexual violence in their lifetime. So assume you can assume trauma when people are walking in your office and learning how to do a trauma sensitive intake, having a trauma sensitive practice. Um, these are all things that um, we talk about. Again, this is something that we saw in the movie of Birth in Pieces. And I, I liked the way that the movie framed it, that the United States is the most dangerous country to have a baby in. <laughs> Um, usually we say that there's a high mortality rate, but to see the U.S. as a dangerous country, even though we spend three times as much on health care as any other nation, um, especially in the OECD that developed nations. But we're looking at even more statistics. Like let's, let's get a little bit like, I don't know if the softer is the right word, but we're looking at really what actually happens out here. So a mother giving in birth in the US is about three times as likely to die as a, a mother in Britain or Canada. And for every woman who dies from childhood, there's 70 who nearly die. So that adds up to about 50,000 women who suffer severe maternal morbidity. And this do, it doesn't include some of the other types of like, so I'm gonna give you a definition of severe morbidity, but for those women who perceive loss of dignity, some of those things that Kathy was talking about, being observed, um, feeling like that they weren't well supported, uh, those are not included in this 50,000. And I got to know this organization, AIM, 
the Alliance for Innovation of Maternal Health, they make something called safety bundles, which I'm, I'm really hoping that they'll do one on trauma and trauma-informed care. Um, but they put the number nationwide at around 80,000 uh, per year after co they conducted a more in-depth study of the um, complications in hospitals in four states. So what are we talking about when we talk about severe morbidity? Um, we know that it's actually increased 200% over the last, I don't know, 20, 10 or 15 years. 60% of that can be prevented. The um, blood transfusion from, from hemorrhaging was the most severe maternal morbidity. Now we know that um, post the perimetal mood disorders are like the most severe of some of the uh, outcomes that we're seeing in, in terms of trauma measurement. But when we're looking at like the physical actual aspects of trauma that happened at hospital, it's been hemorrhaging. But a few years ago, the NPR did a really wonderful expose about what's happening in our maternity care. And what they're saying is that women just don't feel listened to. They don't feel believed. And there is, and that was a theme that was in the movie that we saw also, like they, people didn't feel like they were human. They didn't feel seen or heard there is a, a what they call denial and delay like de delay like people are providers are not really listening they're not getting a sense of what's happening for women or they're denying that it's happening and when they do there is there is this amazing delay that can cost mo mo severe morbidity or even mortality for women so the bottom line is we're not paying enough attention so I, be, I wanted to list a few of the things that Lois and I have seen in, in our work with women over many years. What are those difficult birth patterns for birthing parents and babies? Um, and we, we tried in a very friendly way to create handouts for them because we did childbirth education. Like how do you educate potential you know, people who are coming to have babies? What might happen? And so we tried to Lois, in her wisdom, created a handout that said, a variations on normal. Um, but many people would read through it and say, well, that's not going to be me. So we, uh, but these are the things that we've, that we've seen that sometimes are hard for women. Uh, so that we began to, to list them and try to prepare women for what might happen. But what's when you are a provider, and I'm hoping that there are those of you out there who want to learn this method of being with women, you can normalize for them like this was difficult. These are difficult patterns. You know, labor that starts with a premature rupture of membranes and then you don't go into labor. Often you are in, then induced. Um, you can normalize some of these things and create a lot of warmth and compassion in the space. But over the years, as, as we have invited more and more people to come and present and, and give us an understanding of what happens at births, this is a long list from a medical doctor who actually was also a psychiatrist. He's Italian. He, um, I met him at a fetal brain conference and he, uh, he was a very interesting man. He said in his very Italian accent, he said, as a psychiatrist, he said to me, it felt like I was an inspector who came to the scene of a crime too late. And so he became a medical researcher and was really researching the impact of difficult births on babies. That's how I met him. He was a, schizophren a schizophrenic, schizophrenia researcher. And he found that all these huge lists of events, he was able to weight them and code them and see, these are the ones that are just the, the, the ones that he saw most evident on the impacts of pre adverse prenatal and birth events. And they began to see that these kinds of events, they would have negative in, impacts on birthing parents and babies. But what they really saw is sometimes this, these events had a neurodevelopmental imprint um, and that they would show up later in people's lives when they were 20, 25 or in their 30s because they would create a kind of a, they would create a, 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 a predisposition for a variety of suffering depression and severe mental illness 
this was his research and I have the recording of his presentation um, in my online school. If you're interested, please email me. So coupled with all these things, this mortality and morbidity that we're seeing in maternity services came COVID. And, and this is that research study I talked about, the cross national study of factors of women of where there were seven, nearly 7,000 women. It's just this, 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 all this fear in our space. And we're trying to help women now. And this is, this is a pretty big social experiment that we're seeing happen. Let's prepare, let's help. Let's, let's get wise about how we can help women. And we can do that through the autonomic nervous system and some fairly skillful methods of inquiry and, and ways to create a warm relational space. And I'm going to outline that for you. Before I do that, I wanted to talk about the baby's experience. And um, this has been my specialty. And, just trying to find ways to make sense of it, especially in our United States of America, where there is such high prematurity, we're actually one of the highest countries in the world in prematurity. And so we don't have a good track record. We don't have a good report card. In fact, I, I saw a presentation on the social determinants of health in the United States that researcher Stephen Brzezinski out of the University of Washington said, if, if, if social determinants of health was the Olympics, we would not be getting gold medals. Uh, so we're, we're looking at the impact of this cultural racism and other kinds of discrimination. We're looking at uh, systemic issues. Uh, we're looking at how, you know, it's, it's complex, it's not straightforward. It's like when we talked to, this morning about the movie, uh, the man, the Turkish obstetrician says, well, I feel blamed by these things. And um, we're looking at a lot of complex issues. It's, it's not just one sector, it's their fault. There's a lot going on in our country, the health of our women, the health of our people, and then these layers of experience that's, that started long ago. Things like this, where Amer African-American women are three to four times likely to die as white women. And the infant mortality rate also is fairly high for, for people of color. And like I said, our prematurity rates What's that? What's that about? We spend three times as much money. And what, you know, how can we mitigate this? United States of America. And sometimes I do, I feel outraged. We can do better. We must not know better. And when we're come, talking about our babies, like one in 10 of us is now premature in this country. And, and prematurity is trauma. They can create breathing problems, feeding difficulties, cerebral palsy, developmental delays, hearing problems, vision problems, emotional and financial problems, stress and survival energy. I, I work a lot with families that have NICU experiences. And then I work with babies. This is what I see in my office every week. Difficulty breastfeeding, difficulty sleeping, tongue tie, intrauterine constraint, and then cranial nerve issues. Um, these are all related to bonding and attachment. So then the cycle again starts, like how do you create secure attachment? So what I'm talking about is de developing professionals who really know how to bring mothers and babies and partners all together, working with the whole family, working with uh, the autonomic nervous system, understanding the impacts of births. And it, it doesn't have to be like Kathy said, like the worst of the cesarean sections or the the amount of cascade of interventions. Often it's in the relationship, what happens uh, for birthing families and how can we support them in a way that they feel listened to, they don't feel missed, they don't feel so betrayed. And if they do feel that way, we have the capacity right away to heal. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. We know that, pre that these perimental mood disorders are now a fairly large problem. And I think some of the numbers that are reported here are actually low. I think that more than 10% of fathers report postpartum depression. And by 50% of, of women will not seek help uh, for their mood disorder 
I have found that uh, when I listen to the fetal brain people, they've told me only 5% of women who have been diagnosed with mood disorders get, get completely well. I don't know, Kathy, if you know anything about that, but it felt like we're looking at um, an epidemic of, of, um, of mood disorder, or I would not use that word actually. <laughs> it's probably a normal response to something really completely overwhelming and not enough support in the space. Um, and here's a, a new study that I came across. It took me a while to sort through some of how they found some of this data, but this comes through the Commonwealth Fund and it, it was actually published with the Paternal Summit that was part of the White House a few weeks ago. And I'm very excited about that. I hope that the, the Build Back Better Bill does get passed because what Kamala Harris was suggesting was that she wants to create a sector in hospitals, a birthing friendly hospitals where there is less trauma. So I, I see this as real progress um, having been in the field now over 20 years. And so they use these uh, statistics of how much things cost. And they see that maternal morbidity, this is the suffering that we're talking about from the starting this birth in pieces documentary and all the things that Kathy outlined, $32 billion is what it's costing. This is for our country, United States. And then we're looking at the highest cost of, is the maternal mental health. So $18 billion a year. So when we're talking about, wait, how can we make a difference? It's like, can someone, how much would it cost to train practitioners? How much would it cost to put them to work to really help? What would, what would our world be like if every hospital had somebody who understood the impact of what birth trauma can do and understood complex trauma and understood the relational relationship, understood how to support staff, what would that cost? Okay, so I'm gonna shift now to talking about what we're gonna do about it. Um, when, when I try to try to sort out, and when I listen, this, 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 is, this comes from listening, listening to women. Um, they have found that, I found that there are trauma vectors that are in the relationship. So I took a risk in listing those types of professionals where I found that these are trauma vectors of way that, ways that they've been treated in, the, in, the, uh, birthing, in their birthing practices. So the, these are from listening to women and from the stories that they have had. And these are the practitioners that we still need, that we need to include as a part of support to try and change the systems that we're in. One of the examples was in uh, this study that came out of Australia that looked at trauma themes in childbirth. And this is from the, the, the way that the practitioner talked to them, uh, the things that they said, whether the care provider had their own agenda uh, so that they, they didn't feel seen or heard, or the birthing parent's own knowing was disregarded, sort of in favor of what the care provider thought, care providers lied to or threatened. This is something that's really common that I find that women come in and tell me these stories. Our birthing parents just felt violated. So what I'm hoping to do is to create a pathway uh, for, for a way of, of, of healing some of this. So I had a baby is often when people come in to say, when they talk to me, I actually consult with people all around the world now. They, they say, oh, I had a baby, which is one sentence, one short sentence, right? Four words, I had a baby. So what I have started to do is really break it down into layers. And I'm gonna teach you how I do that. Um, so you, you so I had a baby comes, becomes so much more. It becomes, maybe it's something that started in the ancestors, something, a, a ghost that comes from the ancestral field, like maybe their mother lost a baby or their auntie had a stillbirth. Maybe there's something in the way the baby was conceived. Maybe there's something that happened during the birth, during the prenatal period, which I'm gonna talk about an actual 
Then when it gets to the birth, you can even cut it down into more layers. And I try and help women find empathy and their partners find some of the strengths and positive things that can happen during the, their prenatal perinatal period. So I call that creating layers of support and naming moments of resource and strength. I'm gonna give you an example of that. And then I work on making repair. And this is working with the autonomic nervous system responses to threat and stress. So we're looking at the experience through the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic mobilization for action, that's fight or flight. And then what we see very common are just dropping out, like numb, dissociation, and, and variations of what happens in the nervous system and how it, it can carry a memory. So childbirth is a major event in, our, in the lives of, of any family. And, and finding ways to heal so they do not have to carry the story with them and have it be like, they'd be afraid to hear someone's story or if a birth comes up in an, a movie that they're watching. These are the things that my, my uh, clients have told me are traumatizing. Like they can't, they can't watch a movie and have there be a spontaneous birth with, with, without them cycling and, and spinning out into their own memory. We wanna catch these things and, and we wanna heal these things. All right, so my training, I, I wanna briefly tell you where I got the idea of the layers from. And it, it comes from my pre and perinatal professional training. Um, I was trained by Ray Castellino and Myrna Martin. I was also trained by William Emerson and his students and what we've learned is if, if we can break down what, this is through understanding the baby's experience. But I've grown this. I've grown this to really um, apply it to birthing parents as well. And we're, we're looking at what happens for parents. And we can also put this upon what happens for birthing professionals. What, ha what is their attachment sequence like? What is their nervous system like? What are their strengths? in their nervous system? Where are their challenges? And then we can look at many different patterns. So what I teach my students is that pre the pre-perinatal, it's a time when early memory gets laid down in the body. And it's a memory. It can be lie there dormant until something wakes it up. And often when we get pregnant and have our own babies, our early period might also wake up and want to be addressed. The, what, the way we handle it is we talk about these experiences as memories and memories in our body and we can heal them and we can heal them with presence and we can heal them with facilitation of understanding what are these imprints and what is the felt sense of them and really recognizing them as memories. So when we build skills, we're looking at ways to slow the pace because trauma will push the pace. Trauma will make things go faster. So you wanna to start to really slow the pace and then really listen to what our client wants for themselves. It could be different than what you think should happen, but what, you really be, what we really wanna do is facilitate what it is that they want. And sometimes you can help them set an intention because they may be so lost in what happened that they're not able to. So you want to, to help them. And then you can start to track their autonomic nervous system and demystify that for them. Oh, this is your nervous system. This is the system's normal response to something very overwhelming. And then, like I said, you take the feeling this, that I had a baby and you, and you block it out. You block it out into layers. And you say, in each of these layers, we can name and you can accurate, accurately reflect what happened, even that is settling. And then in, within it, you begin to work with trying to shift the state. It's an autonomic nervous system state that's connected to the trauma or the overwhelm. So step one, you name the layers. The I had a baby sequence, gets broken down into these many different layers. 
So here are some examples of challenges. So preconception, we often have seen previous losses, miscarriages, in other words, um, adverse childhood experiences or history of assault. Like I said, one in three of us has histories of assault. Then if what is conception difficult, if, so, if, if, you, if a family comes into you and they've had assisted reproductive technology, it's, there's, there may be layers of trauma there. So you're gonna to want to be able to get the story and normalize some of this for them, accurately reflect, that was hard. And then um, working with pregnancy, there can be a, a variety of complications or needs for interventions. Uh, there can, some of the women I've, I've worked with have had placental problems or they've had preeclampsia. There's a huge range of issues here. Sometimes there can be um, a, a twin loss or some other types of things that happen. There can be um, mysteries because of the baby has had an experience and we don't really know what it was, but they're telling us it's been, it was pretty overwhelming in there. And the data that we know from listening to fetal brain researchers is that the stress of parents really does has, have an impact on the baby on the inside. So working with mindfulness, as Kathy suggested, working with other types of, of ways to help a woman connect with her baby on the inside and, and, and create a, a relationship through prenatal bonding. And then we're looking at all the different ways that births and birth interventions can have an impact on, on families. And it's not just the birthing parent. It can be the partner who's watching and feeling helpless. Um, it can be some of the moral injury like Kathy was talking about in, in, this, in the nurse, the nurses or doulas. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we could do to address what happens at births, and, but often it's after births there are also things that are very traumatizing, especially if the baby had to be taken to the NICU or the woman had to have full general anesthesia for an emergency C-section and she wakes up alone. There are so many things that happen. So part of what I feel like needs to happen for professionals is to educate all about these things that happen at births and affirm that was challenging, that was hard. And then once you are able to lay out the layers, you listen to the woman and try and find to help her find those strengths that happen, good things, resources, that one nurse. You know, there are many that people can say that when that nurse was on shift, I felt so much better. Um, where was their ease or goodness? Can you help them find it? Because for those of us who've had difficult difficult births or any kind of assaults or challenges or any kinds of trauma, that negative experience become more forward in our minds called negative bias. And you wanna to listen to your, your, your person and try and help them sort it out. I often listen for this, these two words, I knew. When I can find, listen to a woman and help her feel her own knowing, that can be the thread that can really help this woman come back to herself because often these women are not inside themselves they feel bad they feel like they've done something wrong they feel like that, that that's because of something that they did that they haven't had this good birth experience so really listening to them and then helping them find in their body that feeling of knowing that's why I say that helping people recover from birth trauma is a search and restore mission you're listening, you're listening for that knowing and you're helping them feel it in their body. This is a somatic approach. So this is a story I'm gonna tell you about one of my clients, I took her through this. Um, she contacted me and had had a really difficult time. She gave me permission to tell you her story. This is her doing this uh, layers of experience exercise with me. She really got into it. She did all the steps I asked her to do, which is the first one is laying out the layers and finding your strengths and resources within each one, starting preconception. And her story, which I have permission to tell, was that she had chronic illness and thought she couldn't conceive. 
So they adopted a little baby and they were so happy and they were getting ready to adopt another one when she found out she was pregnant. And this was a big shock for her because she had chronic Lyme's disease and other autoimmune diseases. She was really genuinely worried that she couldn't carry the pregnancy to term. And then she found out she had twins. And then that made her even more triply worried. <laughs> Like, how am I going to do this? She was in despair. And she and her husband prayed about it and decided that they were going to have to probably um, abort one of the babies. And this was the hardest decision that she'd ever had. And when she came to me, she cried through the whole first hour because she felt so much shame and fear about being judged around this decision that she had to make. And come to find out that uh, her baby, that the one who survived, uh, the one who she carried, she did not go to full term. The baby was premature. So here's another layer of experience here. And um, I was able to help her by laying out all the layers with her, affirming for her the challenge. And her doctor said, even if she decided to keep both babies, she, they probably would not have gone very far into the into pregnancy. It may, they would not have lasted. So she was presented with one of the hardest binds that any parent would have to have. So we worked very diligently to find those times in, in each of these layers, starting preconception, where she felt happy, where she felt content, or she felt listened to or heard, or had there be a resource. So this is her resource map. She drew out the big circles and she listed in each one. And as we went through each of the layers, I slowed the pace and I just had her feel it in her body. So I just invite you all listening now, think of something that helps you feel the way you like to feel. Relaxed, energized, supported, Maybe you look around the room and find something that you like and feel what happens in your body. These are the kinds of skills that I, I lead women through when they come to find, come to see me and, and their partners too. So the third step is making repair. And um, when we get uh, when we get to the end here, we, you'll be able to ask questions. I see Kathy is still here as well. So when the step three is making repair. And, and this is sometimes very tricky because um, sometimes really what needs to happen is the hospital needs to come forward and say, I'm, you know what, we made a mistake. But they're not going to. That the hospital's not, it's too, too much liability for them. So I'm the one who says that. Like, I'm going to come forward here. I'm going to say, I'm sorry. And there's always ways that we make repair of, with the nervous system using autonomic nervous system approaches. And the very first step is really acknowledging that was hard. And many women want to tell the story. And if you can slow the pace and make it to the point where that they can have their emotions and you are there with them, regulating in your body, the nervous system, they can leave your office feeling so much more whole. In fact, I've seen women get better right away once you're able to do that with them. So what I often will do with, with uh, parents is I, I explain the autonomic nervous system, that once you've had this breach in your capacity to cope, you'll have a spin. And it's, it can spin in, in, you know, with fight or flight or, or freeze or variations of those. So I map it out for them. So I, I think I have mapped it out here for you a little bit. Slowing the pace and then helping people to, by organizing that, the session with their intention, listening to what they want for themselves, have them find it from the inside out. And then I often draw these maps to help them understand that the, their body is like a, the, a, the river of life. It, it rises and falls. It has turns. And, and when you have a trauma, often there's a spin. It can often spin above the fight or flight first. It can easily go to, to um, a peri 
to the freeze parasympathetic below the range. In fact, that's really very common. And one of the problems that we're seeing but trying to help women make sense of their experience um, is that you know, practitioners in the hospital settings are mistaking parasympathetic freeze for compliance. So really educating providers about what these trauma states look like and then really helping clients get it. Oh my gosh, my nervous system was trying to protect me there. So I had a freeze. And sometimes that memory is still in the body. So what we do is we create what we call the counter vortex. That's why I have them name all their strengths and their resources. And then we go back and forth between what's difficult and what's, what feels better or good or even okay, feeling okay is often enough. And we go back and forth using the felt sense. This is somatic experiencing and working with the autonomic nervous system, something that I'm hoping that Kimberly and Johnson will be telling you more about this afternoon. This is our approach. And then I, I just, again, just to recap, I listen. I listen to a, a woman saying, I knew, or even a father saying, I knew. This is, there's a way that I seek to restore that feeling that they, that they have some agency. There, there is recognition inside themselves, some inner knowing. And many women feel betrayed by the system. So I just, I honor their nervous system's natural instincts. And then I make repair. Sometimes I say, I, I'm going to substitute myself here and just say, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. Repair can sound like this, you are right, you are right. And what happens in your body? Was there anyone in this whole uh, experience that you had that felt good or safe? What happens in your body when you remember that? I can say this is not about you. You're not bad or wrong. It's about what happened to you and around you. Sometimes I say, if I was there, what I would have done. Um, I can often affirm that they were exhausted, especially if they have 48 hour labors. They were just overwhelmed. And then I normalize their nervous system's natural normal responses to this overwhelm. I honor how they, they survived. I often say to them that they are superheroes and that there's a way that, you know, that, that, that their resilience can be felt. And then I try to help, help them sort of gradually move into a space of when they felt less scared or less overwhelmed. Like I said, it's a search, repair and restore mission. And in that, you try to find ways to help them feel themselves again. I know this is a lot of technical work around working with the nervous system that you may or may not um, understand if you're not trained in the autonomics, um, but it is teachable and it is learnable um, and you can work with the whole story. So I'm going to, to tell you a story now to complete my time with you and that will give you a chance to see the illustration of this at work. Okay, th so this is the... Um, story of a woman named Rebecca. Uh, she, she came, she was referred to me by my midwife partner, Lois. Um, she was pregnant with her second baby. And in her first baby, um, she uh, went post dates, the baby was very large, so oh, 10 pounds. And during the time she was pregnant with her first baby, her mother died. Um, this was this a very significant uh, event for any a pregnant person to lose their parent, well, sometimes even also a grandparent. And in um, her labor, I mean, her, her baby didn't come, didn't come. So they induced and she they induced her with Pitocin, which, again, can be a very intense way uh, to begin a labor. There are more gentler ways. Um, and though then she had an epidural and the baby coming down got stuck. So she has shoulder dystocia. So I just want to name that if there's anyone in the audience who has this pattern. So I just want to affirm that this family has done very well. I'm going to tell you the rest of the story, but just 
feeling your feet in your seat and looking around the room that this is not your story. It may sound like it, but it, so this mom, her baby got stuck and she tore and they actually had to do a lot of cutting also to get the baby out. And then she had a hemorrhage. And when she first came to me, I mean, she was really so very shut down. She was pregnant. She was in her at the end of her second trimester. And she said, I'm scared. I'm scared to have this, this next baby. And you could see it. She was in a really big shutdown state. Her, her skin would often go very white while she was talking to me. And she would just fade away on the couch as she was trying to talk to me. So um, what I, what I tr tr would do with her was differentiate. So I would say, all right, let's just talk about the difference between this pregnancy and last pregnancy. And we started with naming all the ways. Well, she happened to move to Vermont where I was living at the time. That's where I met Lois. And we would just differentiate. Okay. Oh, a different house. The baby was conceived in a different house, in a different state. Um, and then she, you're having this baby at a different time of year in a different hospital. And every time we would name the difference, I would have her feel it in her body. That differentiation um, is key. That was the first baby. That's a different baby. This is a different baby. This is, it feels similar because you're pregnant, but it's different. And I had her feel all the ways that she was different. But it still wasn't enough to help her get over that fear of what, what's, what's coming. So I took her back to when, before she got pregnant. Tell me about your life before you had babies. And it was there that she came alive. She was a, 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 an athlete and a yoga instructor. And I had her bring back the memory in her body of being that woman, that professional person, that athlete. And her nervous system in her body just came alive. She flushed with color. Her body became more pliable. You could feel the warmth in the space just being with her. And it was there when she began to feel, these are her words, I felt myself again. So as she went into her second birth, she became very proactive. She worked out, she cooked well, she took care of herself. And she had this, uh, she had this uh, desire. She knew she didn't want to go very post dates. So she started her labor with a very, uh, a very much more gentle way than Pitocin. She had her membrane stripped. She had a very short labor, uh, just a little bit of pain medicine called Nubane. And then she relaxed and, re and her recovery was much better. When she came to see me, she said to me, it was a new baby, that new story, that differentiation really helped me clarify my fears and really helped me start again. And she brought that baby to me, the first baby. Her name was Elsie. And we worked with her as well, because from her perspective, her mother um, had a hemorrhage and nearly died. And for her, and she also had a near-death experience. So I worked, to, I, this, is, this is my second clinic. This is, uh, this is I've, I've had two of them. This is so, some of the families I've worked with there here in Charlottesville. But I help parents repair the births um, with their babies also. Because a, a, a family with a new baby is a unit. And often if the baby's not doing, better, not doing well, the mother doesn't do well and vice versa. Sometimes I can treat the mother and the baby gets better. But sometimes we really need to listen to the baby and make repair with the baby. Baby often needs body work and other things, but really bringing them in to connection through um, story and remembering what happened. And I have a way of doing that that I call belly messages or making messages of repair. And we also use play and, and body work. But one simple thing that you can do with the baby it's just affirm what happened, just like you would for a birthing parent. That was difficult. You worked hard. I'm here for you. I'm right here. You made it. You did it. Welcome. I see you. 
So finally, when we're trying to help everyone in the space, remember healing births is not just about the family, it's also about the staff. We want to bring them layers of support. We have this term that we in the pre-perinatal space talk about, it's called two layers of support. Every baby deserves two layers of support. And this is a picture of Mary Jackson, who was one of the midwives that got trained in, more, in learning the baby's experience. But she found that as a home birth midwife, if she had somebody who was just there for her, the birth went better. In fact, she had a whole year of no transfer of home birth to hospital. And that is quite significant. Here in my city, uh, we have about a 20% transfer rate. And so what, you're, what we're realizing is that if, if birth professionals can get support, births go better. So how are we going to do that? And so what I would like to propose is we find ways to, to really support our birth staff, have them feel also acknowledged, seen, heard, and understood. This is the surround. This is the surround around a birthing family. This will help heal some of those ruptures around our relational space. It's just not good enough for some of these parents. They don't feel he heard or seen or understood. Maybe that's what we need to do with the staff and really employ the question, what happened to you? As opposed to feeling these critical stances and trying to really take, you know, take down practitioners who are in the space, even though they probably need some support or healing themselves. The whole system needs to change. So just to conclude here, I feel like the threefold path can be taught um, to every professional. And I'd like to see it in that trauma vector of relationships around birthing parents, lactation, pediatricians, nurses, obstetricians, midwives, and then really embrace the possibility of having professionals that know how to do this and can do it easily. Like I say, I've seen it happen. Just one visit will very much improve what happens uh, for these women, especially women um, who are traumatized by birth. So here's a final, well, this is a, uh, a this is a recent um, quote from a woman I'm, I'm working with uh, through the internet. She said to me, I felt seen, heard and validated and that there is a path I can walk down. I feel I have softened and the work has helped me feel hopeful. This was what she wrote to me after her first session with me. So thank you for listening. You have my handout. You can go and see all the things that are in the online school. And I have a significant amount of references for you. Um, and all this will be put up with the recording. So I'm gonna stop share now and Kathy's still here. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> um, and you, we can, we're delighted to take any questions um, for, the, for a little while, just a few, and then we'll have a break. So you can walk around, get something to eat and come back for Kimberly Ann Johnson's presentation and Molly Carroll May. Okay, Ellie. <laughs> yeah, Kate, thank you so much for that presentation. It was so informative and I feel really drawn to the, the somatic um, approach towards, towards um, healing in any capacity, but especially as it relates to birth work, I think it could be really powerful. Um, I'm, I'm currently a graduate student of clinical mental health counseling and my program focuses on uh, mindfulness-based components. So we learn formal meditation uh, as well and as it relates in, in the therapeutic context. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak towards your use of contemplative practice, if at all, in your practice. I know that it kind of ties hand in hand with the somatics. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that kind of looks like practically uh, in your work mm -hmm. with clients. Well, the very, we, we use five different le levels of skills. And the very mm -hmm. first one is the skill of being or presence. So it, it really is just f focusing on the breath and the body and feeling what your body's making contact with first and you can just just feel yourself in the space um, and then using the polyvagal what we call polyvagal theory <laughs> really understanding how our breath and our social engagement our face 
um, really helps uh, settle the nervous system. We're really just working mostly with polyvagal theory and working with autonomics and our, our connection, our relational connection. Like I don't, I don't teach formal mindfulness. I don't teach meditation. Um, I don't, I, I teach mostly what I would call as a form of focusing, yeah. working with the felt sense in your body and then finding those resources and strengths and ways that you feel okay and feel ease. I, I also teach five different kinds of touch. I, um, I think that the touch can really help people settle and feel connected to themselves and to the present moment. But it's really all I do is mostly teach about presence and helping people find that one, that present day self, the one that made it. I hope that answers your question, Ellie. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Super informative and, and interesting. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, Rebecca. Hi, Kate. Um, Hi. Everybody else who's here. I always really appreciate these uh, presentations and the the depth of of like research and statistical evidence that um, reinforces, I think, what we all know on a deep level that birth is in crisis right now. Um, the place that I continue to get stuck in is how to take this information and translate it into systems change in a system that largely still ignores um, this problem. In addition, I guess the, the clarifying question I would have, hmm, I'm trying to draw my information into one space in my brain here. is like, at what point can we begin to blame the larger system for not, because I hear your heart and I hear you saying like, everybody needs support. And I agree with that. But at what point do we turn towards this larger system? And there's enough statistical evidence. There's enough information. There's enough science. It's all out there. It's not hidden. We can all see it. So at what point do you say like, now it is the problem of the ignorant, right? Those that are refusing to see it, those that don't want to see it. And how do we work with that? And how, as a practitioner, do you work with your outrage and anger to also hold this space of, of healing and potential and hope? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll answer some, I will invite also Kathy to respond. Um, but to answer your last question first, what do I do with my rage and my anger? I get supervision. <laughs> and I and I do have it. <laughs> I do I do get angry because the stories that I hear are horrifying. And you're like, what? How could that possibly happen? And then and so I I have to get supervision. And I'm I'm not I'm not an advocate. I don't channel my energy. Like my daughter is really into social injustice and can really uh, get angry and channel that into her advocacy. Like I'm not a birth advocate. I'm, I work a lot more with creating healing space. And so I get supervision. And then I, in terms of a systems approach, I used to think I could make a difference in the system. I've stopped doing that, Rebecca. What I'm doing is creating a new professional. And in my mind's eye, what I see are stakeholders who are willing to throw down their stake next to the hospitals and say, I'm here. I want to help. I'm, I'm, I have the capacity to do that. And I'm hanging up my shingle here. I'm here right next to you. I'm right here. And I don't, I don't know if the hospital system can really do that kind of um, systems repair. I feel like it has to come from the outside and that's where I am. I'm, I'm on the, uh, I'm gonna, I see a little tiny shop with a sign saying healing here next to the hospital system. It would be my, grit, my biggest love and greatest pleasure if before my time on planet earth ends, I saw hospitals hiring people like me, but I've stopped hoping for that. I'm doing something different. And I think it can work. Um, 
And then the final thing I'll say, and I'll turn it over to Kathy, is that it's the leadership space. And I think there are some wonderful uh, midwives who've become part of hospital boards. We need leaders to, to get to go into these spaces and start to make that change, which Kathy, I think I heard you say that. Is that, that right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But yeah, it's, um, I kind of echo a lot of what, what Kate said. You know, it's like I, when I first got into this, I, I hoped hospitals would listen and they would change, but they, they haven't. And, you know, it's like, especially when I was approaching it from the perinatal mental health side, I thought, you know, it was so entrenched when I started, it was so entrenched in the hormonal model of depression that trauma was irrelevant. You know, they thought everything was caused by estrogen and progesterone, you know, and dropping and, and they, 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 they just couldn't hear it. They, the birth didn't make any difference. Victimization didn't make any difference. You know, even ongoing domestic violence didn't make a difference. You know, of course, now we have research that shows that that's rubbish and that they were wrong. But I kind of did something similar to Kate. I thought, well, you know, I'm not changing the system. I'm probably not even going to get into the mental health system. Although later that did change, you know, 25 years down the road. But I thought, what can I do? It's kind of like the Stephen Covey, you know, seven habits of highly effective people. You know, the first habit is basically kind of identifying what can you do? And it's like, for me, I thought, okay, what I can do is I actually have a, you know, a, a foot in the lactation world. I can educate them, you know, and I've done that for, you know, for years and years and years at this point, you know, and I, one of the people that I enlisted in this process are like the WIC peer counselors, because mm -hmm. I thought, you know, especially with some of our moms who are really the most vulnerable, I mean, who are they going to be talking to? These are folks that would never darken the door of a mental health provider, but they talked to their WIC peer counselor. You know, and so I thought, okay, so this is the, you know, so I carved off a niche for myself too, because I'm convinced where change is going to come is from the bottom. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of that because people say, well, can we need to get the OBs on board. I, you know, I'd love to see them on board, but I just haven't seen any real desire to move in that direction. And, you know, and it's kind of like, and they don't necessarily even want to talk to you if you're not in the same field, which, you know, in some ways I can kind of understand, you know, I get annoyed when people start telling me everything that's wrong with the lactation world and stuff. And it's kind of like, well, I already know that. <laughs> But I get to say it, you don't. <laughs> um, but yeah, I said, I think the, the thing to do, and I think we also have to be careful with our own mental health here, because I mean, there are, there are stories I've heard too that make me sick to my stomach mm -hmm. you know, and make me so angry and there's nothing you can do about it. But it's kind of like, you have to know that it's like, sometimes you just have to set those down and walk away for a bit because otherwise you can't keep doing it. It's, it's just too hard. You know, but if you can kind of focus on, well, what can I do? You know, are there, is there a small area where I can get a foot in, you know, and work from there? I think that that's actually where the change is going to come from, you know, and I can actually honestly see, I think there's, we're starting to get enough of a swell, a groundswell of not only mothers speaking out, but now we're getting the providers starting to speak out. Yeah. COVID has kind of actually pushed that forward too. Um, so I think, I hope you know, that that is where the change is going to be. But yeah, sometimes, you know, I've almost kind of thought, gee, I wonder if we could do like a, almost like a business analysis to show, you know, to show hospital systems and insurance companies that it's worth their while because, you know, you're, they're losing staff and every time they lose staff, it's like probably a hundred thousand dollars to train somebody new, you know, and they're interfering with customer and, you know, uh, satisfaction and experience. You know, because if you've got impaired providers, it's going to make the customer part of that, you know, equation. And so it's like, you know, if we can appeal to their bottom line, but I'm not, yeah, you know, again, like I said, they, they almost have to hear it from one of their own, but it's kind of like, I'd love to actually sit down and start doing an analysis of that, how much money it's costing them to let this system keep going the way it is, because it's really, it is, you said birth was in crisis. That's exactly the phrase that I've been using. You know, I think, we, you know, we've got a lot of impaired providers right now, um, high, high percentages. And we also have then the trickle down effect of what happens then to the families that they affect. You know, if they're damaged, they're going to actually, you know, they're going to pass along. 
you know, and so I actually kind of like the idea. I like Kate's approach about, you know, like thinking about the healing space and what can you do? And, you know, but to answer your question, kind of in a short way, I've given you a long winded answer, but <laughs> I think, you know, the, the big thing is, you know, you have to sometimes just put it down because you can't carry it. If you carry it, you're, you're going to get affected, yeah. you know, and pick it up and think about what, what, what small part can you do to that? I think that's really kind of the only way to survive it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. That was a great answer. And Rebecca, does that feel like a good answer for you today? Yeah, that feels great. Thank you so much. Thanks for your question, Rebecca. Yes. Okay, April. You know, Hi. Hi. I'm here. Hi. Hi. I just, I just had to say I'm so grateful. I feel so in community and I often feel so alone. I work up in my little office by myself and it's just, it feels really good <laughs> to see other people doing the same work. So thank you very much for that. What, what um, I did, country are you in? I'm in Dayton, Ohio. Okay, okay. Excellent. I'm an IBCLC, Linda Smith was my teacher oh. and, <laughs> and an ongoing mentor as I'm sure you would believe. Well, and also too, you know, very interested in the impact of birth. And, uh -huh. and trauma. She's written mm -hmm. a fantastic book. So yeah, I love, love Linda her, Smith. I speak at her trainings. So on mother baby bonding, because I'm a, um, I'm a home birth midwife and um, um, also some out emotional release therapist. So I do a lot of this work one-on-one yeah. -on -one with mother babies. And um, I did want to say one thing I thought you two answered so beautifully about about the impact that is on us as we are witnesses and, and how frustrating it is to feel like we don't get traction with the care providers. But I would give you a little bit of hope, which is that a lot of my clients, as they work through um, their own personal trauma, part of the work that I love to do with them is to find not just the power that they lost in those experiences, but what can they do with it now as they start to feel more powerful. And one of the things I um, love to help them understand is that it's very powerful to share your story with the very people that you're most afraid to share it with. Mm -hmm. And that you may feel like it's nothing, it's a, it's a drop in an ocean, which may be true, but for you, it's everything. And for them, they don't hear the stories that we hear. No, they don't. They have three minutes. I mean, literally they have eight minutes, right? Paid by insurance for a postpartum visit and they see you at most twice postpartum. So I tell people, I feel so lucky that I get to sit with you for hours and hear your stories and work with you on these things. I'm blessed that I get to hear these stories and understand the impact in my body and with you. And they don't have that. They don't understand. As far as they know, they have a live mom and a live baby. So they did their job. Yep. That's not fair for us to blame them. And and feel angry with them when they just simply don't even know. Right. So first steps first is to share those stories, however difficult it is or how pointless or futile it might feel. That's the first step is to help them understand that what they're doing is harmful. Mm -hmm. And then the second step is to, to do what you all are saying, which is, but if they don't understand, then they don't see a reason. There's no impetus. Well, it's kind of like that physician who said he was surprised at the reaction about exactly. I mean, I I think most women would get that mm -hmm. <laughs> because you know we could easily talk. But it's like I mean I don't think this was a bad guy, you know. I I, I it was in his case. I think you know I have met some people who I think are bad people, you know, or <laughs> are like have gotten really. Sure. But sure. I would say in this case, I would say it was more ignorance. Ignorance, yeah. or I always say they have a lot of bosses, right? They're so hogtied, mm -hmm. right? So the one really awesome obstetrician here in town, who's really more of a midwife than an obstetrician in many ways, but he just got bought his practice. He got coerced. He was told he wouldn't have a place to work if he didn't get bought by the over by premier. Mm -hmm. And um, I've seen his practice change radically since that happened. Oh, no. radically I was at a birth recently and the woman decided to have her water broken and we talked through the risks and benefits and she said yes this is what I want and I didn't know that the practice had changed their guidelines and that if there was any mech at all 
everything stopped. She's on the monitor, she's in the bed, it, it, it all hell broke loose. And he hates it, but what, you know, if he wants to have a practice. You know, yeah. and if, if malpractice insurance is over a hundred thousand dollars a year, yeah. it's kind it's of really like, tough. Yeah. 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 No, anyway, I don't, I don't want to hog, hog the time, but I just mostly want to say thank you so much. Oh, well, yeah. I would I'll pass that along to Kate because she's the one who's been the kind of sort of impetus. I've been sort of just sort of tagging along and saying, okay. <laughs> Oh, God. this is amazing so and together so yeah. the healing Kate I wanted to just thank you so much too for the um particularly the the spotlighting on the fact that as you work with the baby you can amplify what they're feeling so that the mother can hear it and that instantaneous release for the mother you know, the baby's telling their birth stories, you do body work with them. And, and you say, Oh, my gosh, did he get stuck in your hip? And she goes, Oh, oh, my God, yeah, he did. And, and he's telling you his story. This is how it was for him. And then she's like, Oh, my God, we went through this together. And it's yeah, just thank you for yeah. pioneering this work. Up the mom and baby that together. They're, yeah. They're well, the whole space changes oh. when, when parents get it, like, the whole thing changes and yeah yeah, yeah. anyway yeah. Thank, thank you april you. thank you well, nice to meet you april <laughs> okay we'll take a few more questions here julie hi kate and hi. kathy hi. i'm in san francisco and uh -huh. i got up at six so <laughs> uh -huh. and i'm going to point that way because that's benioff children's hospital about a quarter of a mile away and over that way is San Francisco General, which is only an eighth of a mile away. And then there's CPSC and then there's Stanford. Um, I became a postpartum doula when I retired from the children's apparel industry. I was a VP at Jim Bree and just fell in love with this work. And I just admire you all. I wish instead of being the past career that I had, I had started this work very early so I could be the powerful voice that I really admire so much in you. But what I ended up doing was creating a skin to skin baby carrier and the Gates Foundation sent me to Rwanda oh. in 2014 when I patented it along with most of the heads of all these hospitals so that we could talk about a tool that helped connect mother and baby and the importance of skin to skin and the whole purpose was to accelerate the understanding of what skin to skin does. I've sold 20,000. It's a lot of work. I'm sitting in my office on Saturday listening to you and then I have to run to the post office and deliver a bunch of carriers. Uh, but I don't see the acceleration. And I was talking to one of our, we have a preterm birth initiative at uh, San Francisco or at Benioff. And one of the main black doulas who's in midwives, who's just amazing and everybody knows her. We were talking at the other day, she wants me to donate a bunch in a, to one of her groups. And I said, sure. But she, I said, in our lifetime, is it gonna change? And she said, no, not in our lifetime. So I'm 75 and I wanna know if I email you, Kate, will you still take me in your program? Oh, yes. <laughs> You, you don't look 75 and you can oh, have I am. <laughs> and I really can because while I love the carrier and how it performs that the message and and I'm I was also a corporate trainer and oh. preschool teacher at Stanford and so mothers and babies have just been part of my life so you know augmenting when they come in to pick up their carrier or maybe I actually do have the shop next to Kaiser Hospital you know or and <laughs> And not only do they get a carrier, but then they get all of, all of the pacing and the love and the attention. And if we were ever to do a clinical trial, the problem with handing these out even you know, is, is wrong because they need to have that investment in this is how it's going to help you. And they, when they do come in here, I had a couple yesterday, they're gonna write their story. He has cyst had cystic fibrosis wasn't supposed to be able to be a parent. They got this beautiful baby. And as soon as they come in and I show them and you know they, they need fitting and they were nearby, it's like, do you still do doula work? Please, my mother is not here. And I, I can't do doula work and run a business. I'm, you know, mm -hmm. 
75 years old, <laughs> but I can talk to them and I can do mother's groups. I'm, I've, I've done groups all my life. So I want to be, I want to be you, but I want to be the part of me that can do it. I just want to thank you so much. And I didn't, I just found you yesterday. So I signed up this morning at, at 5.30. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Well, 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 I'm so glad you did. And uh, people are asking, what's the name of your character? Oh, okay, www.nestingdays.com. And Nesting Days was the name of my doula practice. I did 100 hours of volunteer at San Francisco General with all the methadone moms and the methadone babies and then went out into the community. And I couldn't find a baby carrier that worked from day one that was safe, easy to use, that didn't require origami. And as a doula, you know, I, I, you can't hand them an aspirin. So I'm not going to teach them how to use a carrier that is a liability for me. Right. So I made one and it is, it is. Oh, I can't wait to go have a look. Well, <laughs> and any, you know, I'm the health professionals. I really, I, I'm, I'm not a networker. I'm really not a great businesswoman. I'm, I, I love textiles and I love to sew. And that's how this happened. All right. And I oh, had good. the skill to manufacture it and I make it here in San Francisco. So anybody who wants to learn more, there'll be discounts and, and I'm going to be signing up. I don't know how I'm going to fit it all in, but I'm going to learn because I love learning and I'm well, a yeah. Well, you'd be, you'd be, you probably will be surprised. You already have some of these skills, but let's talk later. Bye. <laughs> right, bye. You too. There's, there was one study published back in 1990, and they had women who were at considered high risk for childhood abuse because they a lot of times had abuse backgrounds themselves, randomly assigned soft carriers or baby buckets. By three months, the mothers with the carriers were more responsive, and by 12 to 18 months, those babies were more likely to be securely attached. Yeah. So my, my, I had a traumatic birth 52 years ago, and we were separated. And um, he was diagnosed with separation anxiety at four. He was also a heroin addict. He writes about it on his website. He's a brilliant musician, sober now 22 years. Second, second baby, I, I fired every doctor up and down the peninsula. Ended up with Nancy Bardicke, who wrote Mindful Birthing. And she had, at Mount Zion, had created an ABC unit. So he was born in a bed in the hospital with my husband and my son, never separated went home the same day and she came out five days in a row for a home visit and made wow. sure I had, she, she thought she didn't call it a doula. She said, I got this Swiss lady and mm -hmm. she's going to come and take care of you every day. And I mean, just the night and day between these two sons, yeah. my other son is a, he's a professor of, uh, he's an ethicist. He's a, he's a philosopher and, um, and his whole life is around moral rage as that's probably what I gave him. The other child, I gave a lot of other things um, yeah. and suffering, but thank you. So, all right. Well, yeah, I'm ready you. to work. Thank you. Julie. What a wonderful, like, you know, second sort of renaissance of a career. That's great. Yeah. Really good story. Well, I know there's other, I see other hands up, but we really are at two o'clock. I want to give everybody a break. Um, so for those of you who have questions, um, please feel free to write them in the chat. I'm going to give us a half an hour now um, to take a break and come back at uh, half past the hour when we can listen to Kimberly Ann Johnson. So thank you all for your attention. I'm going to leave this channel open. I'm going to stop the recording, but please feel free to put your questions and um, we can answer them um, during the break. Thank you so much. <laughs>